everyone and welcome to another video. So this is the moment that a lot of you guys have been waiting for. We are finally going to get in to the Luther analysis. Thank you so much for being so patient with me. As I said in my update video, this was a long episode to analyse, so I hope that I have done it justice. I just want to say a thank you to a few people who have helped me along the way with this. So before we get started, I just want to say a big thank you to Mr. Stevens, who sent me a lot of stuff that helped me with a specific part of this analysis. I hope that I've done it justice for all of you guys and that you find it useful. Before we get into it though, we do have a few shout outs today. So big shout out to Chris, to Sophie, to Tony, and also to Mr. Harold. Better late than never. So let's get into uh, this analysis then. So season one, episode one, this was the uh, pilot episode of Luther. Now we don't really have pilot season in the UK in a, the same sort of way that they do in the US, but you could class this episode as the pilot. So the production and distribution company logo, which is the BBC, is displayed right at the very beginning of the episode. You'll see that it's also as a watermark on all of these clips. That's because I got all of these clips from iPlayer. And I'll pop a link to that down below in the uh, description box. This is displayed mostly as a form of recognition and credit. And the opening scene initially gives us this establishing shot where we see the um, sort of warehouse. It's full of low key lighting, so lots of darkness, lots of shadows to connote there's a level of danger and crime. There's also a slight low angle here as well, which makes the setting and the building seem quite imposing. This is then contrasted with a high angle where we see our first character who is Henry Madsen. He seems much, much smaller because we're viewing him from this high angle. And it's also implied that he is um, sort of a, a, like a victim or prey by the fact that he is running. We then get this mid shot where we see both the facial expression and the body language of Madsen. This connotes his fear. We get a camera panning around him, signifying that he doesn't know which way to turn. And so we're unaware whether he's victim or villain at this point, although everything is setting up that he is likely to be the victim. Following Madsen, we see this figure who is continuing after him. This places him into the sort of predator and prey trope. So we realize now that he's most likely to be a victim. The figure's not identifiable, but we've got very dark dress codes, which suggests sort of evil. We then have Madsen running towards the camera, so the audience are directly involved in the action. This chase scene is also really important because it builds the tension and enigma of the storyline. We then have further enigma built when we fail to see who's chasing Madsen. So obviously we know from hindsight that this is Luther, but at the moment his identity is kept mysterious because we've got shadows across his face sort of like building up to this big reveal of who it actually is. So shots of the other figure sort of mirror the same path that Madsen has taken. So we get very similar shots. This suggests that the person chasing him is really skilled and sort of following in his footsteps. And we have a lot of cut shots between this mysterious figure and Madsen as he continues to move up the building. We have this sense of foreshadowing that there's going to be an eventual meeting between the two because we know that Madsen can't keep running. We then get this point of view shot which involves us, okay, so although it's over the shoulder at this point, it does make us feel like we're behind Luther, like we're part of his team right from the start. We then have a change to a completely different location where we get these conventions of crime drama because we see the police cars moving onto the street and it suggests that what's happening is this sort of time sensitive critical case which raises the tension here. So we start the episode off with a bang as it were, really wanting to engage and entice the audience because a pilot's job is to bring in the audience and keep them engaged so that they're likely to have big viewing figures and then the series can continue as a whole. So we get to meet a couple of other characters here. We get to meet DSU uh, Rose Teller. She's played by Saskia Reeves, so she might well be known for other crime dramas that she starred in, such as Waking the Dead. She seems to have a high level of importance because she's right in the centre of the frame and people are looking at her for guidance. 
We then get another character introduced, DCI Ian Reed. Suggests that these characters are going to be of importance not only in this episode but as a ser- of, of the series as a whole because they spend sort of a lot of time with them and their position so importantly. We then go back to Madsen who seems very, very small compared to the building around him. He's in the centre of this high key lighting so everything else around him very very dark full of shadows but he's placed in the only bit of light that we get which makes it seem like there's this sort of spotlight on him he continues to move further up the stairs his facial expression suggests that he's got a long way to go but also that he's getting tired so that suggests to the audience that again he can't keep running at this point we get another over the shoulder shot of Luther as the predator chasing Madsen. Again, he still remains this enigma. The audience are not sure who he is. We get no distinguishing features about him, building this tension and suspense. He then, Madsen then stands out against uh, the sort of light in the background. So before we had Madsen in this pool of light where he was sort of illuminated like he was a spotlight. Now he's almost a silhouette. The fact that this is also a long shot signifies that he's moving higher and higher up the building and so he himself seems smaller, which again suggests that he's going to be more vulnerable. Now that centre shot is designed to show that the pursuer is still on his tail. He's still very mysterious, but his movements seem very deliberate compared to Madsen's, which were more desperate. We then get this high angle point of view shot where we're positioned almost like we're Madsen, making us feel more vulnerable. And this again adds to the whole tension and suspense that we've got going on right at the beginning of this episode, setting up what is about to come. Now the set indicates a level of peril because we see the walkway begin to collapse. Now this obviously foreshadows that one of the characters is going to fall and the audience now are aware of this. So we get a little bit, I suppose, of dramatic irony as well. We know something is going to happen and that makes us sort of be in this privileged position where we're just waiting for what we know is going to happen to appear on the screen. By using a low angle shot though, to watch as this piece of debris sort of falls from the walkway, we see how dangerous this situation is. And so the tension is raised right up to this sort of critical point. And this starts the season and the shaft as a whole as being something that's very high in, like sort of has quite this high intensity to it. Now Madsen's facial expressions clearly show fear and bring an end to the chase because we can see very clearly here that he can no longer run. Now in your exam if you get asked about things like props it might well be worth commenting on the fact that we've got this padlock door. The padlock is clearly visible here in the centre of the frame to show us that there is nowhere else for him to go. You could also bring that into setting as well if you're asked about that. Now Madsen shows himself to be a villainous character here by reaching for a weapon. It is an unconventional weapon, so I suppose it shows or foreshadows the fact that he's not going to win this, but it does sort of place him in that villainous aspect. We then finally have our mysterious figure revealed. Idris Elba finally appears on our screen. So we have the sort of titular character Luther being shown here, but Also, Idris Elba is well known from other crime dramas. So one of the first things that he starred in was The Wire, which was an American uh, crime drama. So he's likely to be known not only in the UK, but on BBC America as well. And so we start to think, okay, well, if this guy is this big actor, he's likely to be our protagonist, our main character. And so we start to associate him with Luther's name even before we've heard it. Now, the cutting between the shots of Madsen and Luther become quite extreme. So we go to extreme close-ups. We get the two of them becoming closer together. So we get this climactic moment where they're both in the same frame, in the same place. And we are waiting for this showdown. As Madsen steps out onto the unsafe walkway, again, we have a sense of climax because what the audience knew was going to happen actually happens. He drops through the walkway. This is one of the ways that the show is entertaining. So linking this to Bloomlet and Cats, it's engaging right from the start. We have that same low angle matching Madsen's low status here, but also suggesting that he's going to fall just the same way as the walkway did because it's literally the same shot. Luther is in this third uh, shot here presented to have both the upper hand 
physically and mentally. He's also got more power because he stands over him and the low angle makes him seem more powerful and more dominant. The conversation between Luther and Madsen though is very unusual. We know that as a police officer Luther should be assisting him, bringing him to justice, but he's not dressed like a detective and he doesn't behave like one. So we've got his character being established right from the start which is going to give us some more information for future narratives. Equally, Madsen's character is moved from victim to villain, so quite unusual in terms of our positioning of characters here. Luther is using the peril that Madsen is in very clearly here to get information, so we've also got this sense of vigilante justice that the audience might well approve of. However, we've sort of got two pieces of action happening at the same time because we cut away now to a photograph of what we believe to be the real victim. The fact that she's female falls into this sort of expected conventions for the genre and also for gender as well. And also the fact that she seems very much like a child or is a child evokes this emotional response from the audience because there's sort of these unwritten rules that one, you don't mess with women and two, you really don't mess with children. Now the phone call is a very unorthodox way of finding the victim but again we've got this countdown or this sort of count up timer on the phone showing this time sensitive issue and showing this time sensitive case. So again we're back to enigma, tension, suspense. We have these very small dips where we get a sort of relief from the climax before it builds right back up again. So not only does this engage the audience and leave them wondering if the victim is going to be found, but it also keeps us entertained all the way through. Now there's a significant pause between Teller and Reed, which connotes that the resolution really hinges on Luther, that they're sort of at a loss as to what's going to happen. And this again tells us that he's going to be the protagonist or the main character of the show. As soon as they get the confirmation, the action moves very quickly. The camera follows the, di the detectives right into the house, suggesting that again, we're a part of the team because we're put into this point of view where we are almost the camera following them as they go to save this victim. Interestingly though, Madsen's house seems very normal, so in terms of setting here we can comment on the fact that it's a relatively normal house, this makes the show quite relatable, but also conforms to this convention that there's very little difference between villains and everyday citizens, which is something that we would expect to see in the news where real crime, real life crime is being reported on. We cut back to Manson in the Madsen in the centre frame and Luther draws out the suffering that he's going through. Now this almost makes us feel sorry for him and is a really good example of where Luther sort of blurs the lines where on the one hand we've got what's ex expected and established within society and where we sort of want things to go. So it gives us this sense of living, I don't know, vicariously through Luther you know, and being this non, not necessarily law-abiding citizen. In the final shot that we've got here, Luther shows how emotionally invested he is through his outburst. He almost crosses the line here by threatening to stamp on Madsen's hands, but he doesn't actually do this. So we have this idea of foreshadowing again set up. This is something that we're likely to see from Luther throughout the show. And also sort of indicating that he does have a line that he's not willing to cross. Now when we find the victim, uh, she's posed as if she's sort of in a coffin, so this reinforces and um, sort of suggests her innocence as well as raising enigma as to whether or not she's going to be alive. Teller is then established as a sort of motherly character, a motherly figure, because she's the one who starts to give the chest compressions to the victim to try and bring her back to life. And we have these cutaway shots where we go back and forth from the victim to the villain to, again, keep the tension and suspense moving and also to show that this is happening at the same time. These two different scenes are happening at the same time and a part of the same narrative. We have this extreme close-up of Madsen's fingers clinging to the walkway, so again, reinforcing this idea of peril that Madsen is in, making us wonder what's going to happen to him. 
When the victim wakes up, though, we get this moment of relief for both the audience and the characters. Now, this is something that is very common for dramatic narratives to keep the audience engaged in the programme. And Luther, we see as well, also shows relief through his facial expressions. But we also get this moment of conflict because he doesn't immediately move to save Madsen, which, again, we find unusual and we find strange. And that links to this final shot that we've got on the screen here where his shoe moves into focus. So we get a visual representation of this conflict because at this point it could go either way as to whether Luther will save or whether he will sort of condemn Madsen. Now as Madsen falls, Luther takes a step back, perhaps suggesting some sort of shock that's felt and that's a shock that's likely to be felt for us as the audience as well. Now as Madsen falls we have this sort of slow motion effect to emphasise what's happening and the fact that we see so much of what happens to Madsen might be why the show was given such a high rating when it was released on DVD. It's certainly one of the reasons why it was shown after the watershed and comparatively this shot really isn't sort of as graphic as things get in this episode. Now, in the third shot, it was quite difficult to pick shots without repeating myself, but Luther goes through a range of emotions over the next few frames. So this is just an example of one of the emotions that he goes through. And what seems to be quite surprising is the fact that in some of those frames, like the one that we've got here, he almost appears to be smiling. So one of the things that makes Luther, I think, such a interesting character is that he has these flaws. He's not set up to be a perfect character. And in some sense, this is sort of indicating that he feels what happened was justified. We then go into the title sequence, which has this red tint to it. The red is commonly associated with blood, and that's, a, again, a recognisable convention of crime drama. But it could also indicate a level of danger or a warning here. The name of the ca actors are capitalised in sans serif, sorry, sans serif typography, which stands out because of the white colouring. We have Luther's silhouette recognisable against the London landscape, establishing his character and also the setting. And it's also quite interesting that Idris Elba is the first name shown, so we have this link between him as an actor and the title character as well. We then get sort of x-ray like images of teeth. This has a link to forensics, so again another convention of the genre. A further convention is the police tape that we see over the course of the next frame. Now the second name to appear is Ruth Wilson. She's a very recognisable actress despite the fact that we haven't seen her yet. So we get another level of interest for the audience. Also this idea that she's going to be quite important to the show as a whole. Other conventions of crime drama like the fingerprints are then shown sort of mixing in elements of the genre along with the actors and the characters that they're likely to portray. We then have a sort of illuminated map view of the city. This could represent that the action is going to take place here, but it could also, from this angle, sort of represent nerves and this idea of a thought process, because Luther is very much an intellectual character. Now, recognisable London locations such as the Gherkin building can be seen within the title sequence, so we get a level of relatability for the audience which is in contrast to the fingers that are sort of reminiscent of a victim, again indicating a level of sort of recognised conventions for the narrative and also the crime drama genre. The eye that we see here though has no distinguishing features. It does seem to have a brighter sort of tint of red to it, which could imply that this is a victim of some sort, particularly when you compare this to the extreme close-up of Luther's eyes, which in this instance reveal a very little emotion and appear to be looking at something just outside of the frame rather than the audience. So this is sort of that in-between direct and indirect mode of address. We have a bullet hole, which is another convention of the genre. It's also indicative of other title sequences, such as uh, CSI, which are obviously American crime dramas. And then we get these sort of coloured drops that sort of spread through the title sequence, a bit like ink. These could be representative of blood, given that they reveal Luther's silhouette. They also could potentially link him with crimes, um, but not in a detective 
crime sort of way, which will hopefully become more apparent later on. There was, a, was quite a difficult way of explaining that one. The creators given the credits at the end along with the producer and executives of the show and in the penultimate shot of the title sequence we can see Luther's face as a watermark. However, this time it is as if he's looking directly at the camera so we get direct mode of address which creates a connection between the audience and Luther as a character. In the final shot of the title sequence we get the name of the show. Given that it's named after, after the protagonist this sort of cements his importance within the show and also shows that the narratives are going to revolve around him. In the establishing shot that we have of London in the centre, there's quite a greyness to the scene, so this could foreshadow some of the emotions of the characters that we're going to meet, but also gives this sense of pathetic fallacy where the weather is matching the mood and tone of what it is that we're seeing on the screen. Now the corridor that we see in the third shot here, very recognisable as a hospital setting, implying that there may be another victim, gives this idea of time passing, but it's only as the camera zooms out and that we get this selective focus sharpening that the audience realise we are looking at a psychiatric ward. Luther then appears to be sort of contemplative, however his expression is very hard to read given the indirect mode of address. This coupled with the nervous body language that we get in that middle shot adds a sense of tension to the scene. In the wide shot we can then see that Luther is in fact the patient. Now this subverts the stereotypes of police and detectives and subverts what we would expect. It, this is one way in which Luther is sort of set apart from the crime dramas of the time. Now DCI Read shows a sense of concern in this close-up that we get here. It gives a level of direct mode of address to again create a connection with the audience and he is going to be important for the series as a whole. I'm not going to say too much more because I don't want to give any spoilers away. You will just have to watch the show if you want to know about it I guess. And this is reinforced by his hand on Luther's shoulder. It's quite awkward though because Luther appears a bit vacant and this is unlike the way that we have seen him previously. But when we have the cut to the third shot at the end here, this gives us a sort of sense of knowledge and understanding about what's happened in the time between the last frame of the opening sequence and now. Now in the hospital corridor, Again, it sort of mimics the one that Luther was in earlier, but we've got a police guard that's on sort of scene guard here, which adds to that level of seriousness. And the hospital setting is then contrasted with this shot of a upper class rural household that we can see here within the woods. Now the images on the mantelpiece again provide this element of relatability with the audience, so again linking it to Bloomer and Katz, so we can identify with the programme a lot more. But it also reveals Ruth Wilson's character because the image that we've got of her on the mantelpiece is very, very recognisable. As the camera moves through the house slowly, it allows the audience to digest the scene in much the same way as a police detective would. This also makes the shot of the dog more shocking to the audience when they see it and it is overly gruesome. Equally, the high angle that we get when we're looking down at the other victims make us feel like we're more dominant over the victim and adds to this overly dramatic sense because as an audience, we don't really need to see this much detail to understand what has happened. Wilson's character, when we finally meet her, seems very small and vulnerable due to the position of her hiding behind the chair. At this point, the blood on her hands makes her seem like she's reacted to the scene, but it could suggest that she's had a hand in what happened. And when we get further into this episode, we realise that that is in fact the case. Other items that we see on the desk, such as the iPod, anchor the show to the time it was produced, as well as emphasising that the victims were very wealthy. And when we meet Alice again, she seems very much like she's in shock. She is more composed than previously seen, so this sets up her character not only as a victim, but as somebody who's very good at sort of compartmentalising their feelings. And we'll come on to that a little bit more as we get into this episode. Now the cut to Luther is quite jarring because it's unexpected but it links him with the crime scene that's happened with Alice already. Now the fact that he's looking down from the walkway where Madsen fell is unusual. It could suggest that he feels a sense of guilt. Teller then seems quite nervous as she enters but she does seem more dominant than Luther because she's standing over him. So this subverts what we expect 
because we've seen um, sort of Luther and Madsen on that walkway previously, but it also subverts what we would expect because Teller is a woman with him with quite a bit of power here. Now, in the middle shot, the two of them seem almost equal. We also get to see Luther's dress codes, which again suggest this level of informality because he appears quite scruffy. They make him seem less of a hero, given that they're dark in colour, even though we would expect Luther as the protagonist to fall into the hero role in Prop's character theory. We then get an over-the-shoulder shot, making us again feel like we are part of the team before we're being introduced to DCI Justin Ripley, who's played by Warren Brown. He's viewed through a slight high angle, so it makes him seem much smaller compared to Luther, who again seems more dominant. But in the centre shot, we see them as equal. So this is likely to suggest that Ripley is going to be the helper to Luther's hero. And in that sense, Teller then becomes this dispatcher. Again, by viewing the action through an over-the-shoulder shot as they're getting into the car, it makes us feel like we are a part of it. We can almost imagine ourselves sitting in the back of the car being a part of the team. So we're very much engaged within the show and it's likely to make us more active audiences. As the car moves out of the scene, it could suggest that Luther is starting something new, a little bit like a new narrative or a new storyline, and is moving away from his past with Madsen. Interestingly, in that centre shot that we've got here, the movement between Ripley and Luther is in sync, showing that they already have a close bond and close connection, and they're likely to maintain this throughout the series. When we move to the third shot, we get this yellow comb, which is a convention of crime dramas, but again, it's unnecessarily shocking, which might link it to the 15 that the BBFC rating gave it when the show was produced as DVD. Now, Luther in Alice's home already seems to sort of cover the frame, which makes him seem more dominant. And again, we have such a slight low angle here, um, which again adds to his dominance and could suggest that he's got a certain level of command over the scene. However, in the next shot, we get a high angle. Now, this makes it seem like the case might not be as easy as expected, given that the crime scene suddenly seems larger and more imposing. What's quite interesting, again, in terms of Luther's character, is that when he meets one of the victims, he's sort of positioned next to her and on a similar level, suggesting that there's an emotional and person connection, that, personal connection that he has with his job, whereas Ripley seems removed and more impartial because he is removed. Evidence of Alice's character and influence can then be seen through the academic awards on the wall, suggesting her intelligence. This is going to be important later on, so it provides a level of foreshadowing, even if the audience don't realise it yet. Now, another recognisable location for crime dramas is the police station. This seems quite mundane and old, but because it's viewed through a slight low angle, it could suggest the power that the police wield. This is in contrast to Zoe's building, who is the new character that we're introduced to in that third shot. The transparency suggests that it's a sort of high class, so we have her at odds with Luther right away because they don't seem like they're particularly well matched. Luther, though, seems much happier when he's talking to her, indicating that he is actually quite an emotional person, and so we get more information about his character here. This makes him seem more realistic, but also gives us an indication to the flaws within his character, which we can imagine are going to pop up later in the series or perhaps the show. Now, the fact that Luther has to type in a code into the door suggests high security, but it makes us as an audience feel like we're being let in on a sort of exclusive secret. So it makes us feel like we're getting something that we wouldn't get from another show. The office, though, seems very stereotypical with different desks and colleagues around. As they welcome Luther back, the audience might relate this to their own lives, as the office at this point could represent any sort of setting. However, the mug that they give him appears to be in quite bad taste, particularly given that Luther has just returned from a psychiatric ward. This does provide comic relief for the audience, though. We can't have that high tension staying the same all the way through the show, particularly for one that's as long as Luther, because we turn off. As an audience, we can only handle a certain amount. So the comic relief here is likely to, one, be recognised by demographics who work in the emergency services as perhaps a necessary part of their job, but it's also a sort of moment of peace within the show for the audience where we can sort of gather our thoughts before the tension and the pace increases again. Now the view of Alice in the middle shot sets her up as villainous through her positioning. Her hands are on the desk implying a sort of sense of 
needing to see it, all of her movements. But the blue boiler suit also makes her seem like she's somebody who's protesting her innocence. And we have this sort of trans similar transition that we've seen earlier, which is again this cut shot from what we see within the police station to Zoe's boyfriend. Now this provides a level of conflict for us as an audience because we are set up to want her and Luther to work out. It does give us some indication of the subplot, but it also gives us as an audience a sense of power because now we have dramatic irony. We know that she has arranged to meet Luther, but we also know that she has a boyfriend which she hasn't told him about, so we're in quite the position of power at the moment. Cutting back to Alice, she seems quite small compared to the surroundings. These are also recognisable as conventional settings of crime dramas. Although one difference perhaps between UK and US crime dramas is that Luther in particular makes the setting seem very sort of or much less glamorous compared to the US crime dramas. Now immediately Luther commands dominance through the fact that he towers over Alice who's sitting. Her facial expressions suggest a level of hurt or give us these expected emotions of someone who's lost their family which makes her story seem more plausible. But Luther's need to understand and work things out can be seen when he starts to question Alice and together we realise that something isn't quite right. Now we also meet a further character here, the Detective Chief Superintendent. He's the most superior in the police which is reflected through the fact that he remains standing over Teller and the fact that the door is closed for the majority of their conversation. We get more information here as the conversation is clearly closed off to other characters and provides an insight into Luther's character which we had already worked out that he's somebody who doesn't necessarily play by the rules and he's a sort of loose cannon within the department. Now Luther's body language in that centre shot is quite unusual to what we would expect. He seems more relaxed and informal, particularly when the audience remember that he's interviewing a victim. This would tie in with the sort of drama perspective, which suggests that stage right, what's left to us as we're viewing it, is associated with good characters. So again, we're sort of given the idea at this point that Alice is good, that there's this plausibility to her story. However, the camera starts to break the 360 degree rule and moves beyond 180 degrees, meaning that we view Luther from the other side. And what the camera does here is it physically mimics the swing of power between him and Alice who are having a battle of wits. Now that 360 rule is perhaps quite difficult to get your head around. So there will be a shot later on that shows this in a sort of more clearer fashion. Now Luther bursting through the doors suggests that he's already solved the case and viewing back his interview sort of provides a meta experience. We're watching television characters watching themselves on a screen. So adds a sort of different experience for the audience and also shows a significance to what's, what is about to be revealed. Now the yawn indicator provides some sort of audience interaction with the programme. If you're anything like me, whenever you read that word or you hear me say that word, you really want to do the action. And I would be interesting to know how many of you are doing it now. <laughs> but it sort of emphasises the lack of emotion from Alice. And if the audience themselves respond to what's being shown, then perhaps it can create an interesting social talking point amongst the people who are viewing. Tell us pride can then be seen through her facial expressions. And it fills in some of the gaps for Luther's character because we've only seen him in the Madsen incident, so we're not aware of how he usually behaves. His body language also seems more animated, which shows off more of his character and shows how much his career means to him. This is quite different to when we see Alice. Her expressions haven't changed, but for some reason, we get less emotion from her here. So this adds to what has been revealed about her at the moment and gives more information about her character. We get an extreme close-up on that cup of tea to reveal that she removes her fingers from it just a fraction too late and this reinforces the idea that she has no emotions and feels no emotions which is again reflected through many of the shots that we have here where she seems more animated, particularly when she realises that she's met her match against Luther. So the extreme close-up indicates she's no longer upset and this subverts what we would expect to see of a victim. 
Now that 360 degree rule is more evident here. When we first saw Luther and Alice, we had them the other way around. It was almost like we were standing at the door looking towards the back of that interview room. But now the camera has swung all the way round to show that Luther has more power and also indicates this idea that Alice, who would be um, and also indicates that the two characters are equal given that they, they're sort of looking at each other and the camera has no angle. The audience also witnessed this battle of power because Lusa moves around the room. He attempts to exert his dominance over Alice by standing and making himself taller, but she doesn't react, showing that she's not only a villainous character but also further implying her lack of emotion. Luther's facial expression clearly shows his frustration being unable to prove what Alice has done. It shows the recognition of the narrative as a whole and also adds to the enigma as the audience want to know how this will be solved and how Alice will be brought to justice. There's also an apparent role reversal within this interview scene as Alice is the one who is more composed. When considering this from a drama perspective, the stage left, which is our right, is usually viewed as bad. So here we have, from a drama perspective, Alice being linked to a villain. This shifts the balance so that we feel like evil is winning, but because it's so early on in the plot and in the series, we are unaware of how all of this is gonna be wrapped up and brought to some sort of resolution. We then have a wide shot of the police station, which adds to the setting, makes it more realistic, but also involves us because we, again, feel like we're part of the team. We can imagine ourselves sitting at one of those desks. We then get another shot of Alice um, sort of sitting on her own in the interview room. And because we are viewing her in that way and she is literally um, sort of locked up, makes her seem like the prey. And again, the police in this instance are going to be the predators. Now, the close-up shot of Luther again shows the frustration in the fact that he can't simply put Alice away, but we can also see how he's already starting to work out how to bring her to justice, and this may be something that the audience are also feeling. So one of the gratifications of crime dramas is this idea that the audience get to play along and get to play at being detective. Selective focus is used to emphasise Alice's facial expression. This is timed to show that she's very intelligent because it links with what the characters were talking about in the previous shot. And this idea that she already knows that she will be released. We then have the selective focus switching to make Luther more important and it adds emphasis to his character. The way that he's positioned is overly formal compared to how he acted in the interview previously, but also makes him seem like he's ashamed, which we can see in that last um, shot here. At this point in the narrative it sort of suggests that he's lost which again goes against our expectations because the bad guy seems to have the upper hand here. Now transition shots are usually wide shots of the city and this illustrates not only a change in scene but because of the nighttime view that we've got here also suggests a change in time. Alice's reactions as we see her in the back of the car seem to be gloating and again suggests that she knows she's gotten away with it. It could also be that she has met her intellectual match in Luther. Now her apartment reveals more about her character although it seems like she lives in this normal apartment. As the, cam as the camera tracks her through the apartment it shows that it's more modern, more sophisticated and also very clean which I suppose adds to her character in that she's very precise. Now the cutting between Alice and Luther already establishes a connection between the two of them, although Luther seems to show a sense of nervousness or relief compared to the way that Alice was within the car. However, when we cut back to her in the apartment, she's going through the same emotions. So this creates this big link between the two characters, which is something that's going to be important for this episode as a whole. This shot in the centre also reveals more about her intellect through the fact we've got a computer, we've got textbook, other sorts of props on the desk adding to her intellect. Now, when Luther opens the uh, knocks on the door and Zoe opens, his smile seems kind of unnatural and forced, suggesting that the next scene is going to be quite tense. 
Zoe also appears quite small despite the fact that she sort of dominates the door frame. We get this over the shoulder shot again to make us feel like we're within the scene but we can also see the physical distance between Luther and Zoe which mimics the distance that's in their relationship. Now conventions of romance are included in the centre shot but it adds to the tension between the couple and also us as we're viewing it because we've got this dramatic irony where we know that Zoe already has this other man in her life and so we know why she's putting off Luther's advances. Close-up shots though show the level of emotion that Luther feels and this is a method of connecting and engaging with the audience who see him as more human and may also relate to some of the things that he's going, that's going on with him in his personal life. We then get selective focus emphasising his expression and there's a pause in the action and sound here which suggests that he's trying to gather his thoughts and sort of compose himself. We have selective focus again but in an over the shoulder shot and the perspective twists so that we start to realise Luther has lost the battle with his emotions. Now even though we realise that, the violence that comes from him in this third shot is really shocking and raises this tension again within us as an audience because the last time he lost control, Madsen fell from the walkway. So we know that when Luther loses control, bad things happen. And we can see that in the close up on Zoe's face. This emphasises the fear within the scene, particularly because she doesn't move very much. So we are then only able to focus on her facial expressions and this perhaps causes some sympathy and empathy where we perhaps relate to the character or can at least empathise with how they might be feeling. Now as Luther moves away, the light coming through the broken door seems to be brighter to anything else that's going on within the scene and this emphasises the destruction that he's caused. It's also interesting that he's created this much destruction and makes him seem more animalistic, like he's just given in to his sort of natural instincts. After he composed himself though and he leaves uh, Zoe's, he gives direct mode of, the, of address to the audience and this shows how he sort of compartmentalises his emotions. He's now calm and focused compared to the incident that literally happened just moments beforehand. We cut back to the scene though to emphasise the emotions that happened here and to really leave the audience with these emotions. Zoe still hasn't moved and is frozen in shock which might well be what some of the audience are experiencing as well. Now we have a cut to this extreme close-up of Luther taking off his wedding ring. Anytime anybody takes a wedding ring off in any sort of show, it's very symbolic of the relationship being over. Now the bar, as we zoom out and we get Reed entering, is very stereotypical, but it almost seems Americanized here. The idea that um, the men are sitting at the bar rather than a table, there's very low-key lighting, and this is all very conventional for crime dramas as a whole. Now we get another establishing shot of London, suggesting that we're in a different scene. And because we're in a different scene, we're likely to be focused on a new character. Now at the moment we can't see that new character because they're only a sort of different coloured blur on the screen, which we can see through this selective focus. And it's only as that selective focus becomes sharper that the camera changes to show us Alice is alert and has this similar look of focus on her face to Luther. So again, creating a link between the two characters, which is further emphasised when she starts to search for him on a website that is clearly meant to represent Google. Now, this is a very recognisable page for us. And the fact that Alice is searching for Luther creates this tension and suspense because we know that if she's searching for him as a villainous character, there's got to be something wrong or something bad is going to happen. Now we bring up a page on Madsen revealing to Alice information that we already knew and we also see that Zoe has been searched for as well and the fact that Alice is focusing on people who are close to Luther in some way again raises this suspicion within the audience. Now interestingly we have a cut to a crematorium here now combining this shot with the two that we've just seen of Madsen and Zoe 
uh, creates a connection between all three. And the suggestion is that Zoe and Madsen are not safe. The dog was in the house when Alice um, sort of murdered her entire family. So we can imagine that a similar sort of fate is going to befall the other two characters. Again, the cremation of the dog is really graphic and shocking to the audience who may well have pets of their own. But even if the audience don't realise it right now, retrospectively, this also gives us this idea of criminals burning the evidence of their crimes, which is what Alice is effectively doing here. We then move to a wide shot showing Luther and Reed. It's clear that Reed is closer to the foreground, which places him in the position of sort of helper or sidekick to Luther. And it's again another common convention of crime dramas. But the way that they're moving is almost a, a sort of replica of the way that Luther and Ripley moved earlier in the scene. We cut back to an establishing shot and this establishing shot we saw right at the beginning of the show and we're going to see later on as well, illustrating a change of time and a new scene. Interestingly, that same shot is always associated in some way with Alice, who we see here. Now, she's giving di indirect mode of address and suggests that she's having a conversation with someone else off camera. And the fact that she's happy implies that she is talking to Lusa, which makes the middle shot really unusual and jarring because we don't expect to be given this close up shot of the urn containing her dog. And that's unusual in itself because we would expect that if she was going to keep any remains, she would be keeping those of her family rather than her pet. So this creates a sense of enigma because we wonder why she's doing this as well as setting up that this particular prop is going to be important for later on in the show. Now the long shot emphasises how small Luther and Alice are which makes them seem insignificant but what is important is that their body language suggests that they have a closeness. This again subverts what's expected. We know that police and we know that detectives are not meant to be getting this close to potential villains or victims. A further subversion comes when we see Luther inside Alice's apartment. So we know now that he's definitely crossed the line and is this sort of character who really doesn't play by the book. And this is a further convention of crime dramas, particularly ones that focus on a individual character. Now, the shot of a black hole effectively positions Luther on one side and Alice on another. And on a deeper level, you could argue that it suggests that they are both getting sucked into the situation that is happening, which is, on the one hand, the case that Luther is trying to prove and that Alice sort of wants notoriety for, but they're also getting sucked into each other. And this is further illustrated by that third frame that we've got here, where after a lengthy conversation, Luther and Alice are positioned in place that is very similar to conventional characters who are in a romance. This raises the suspense and enigma because we want to know if they're going to become a couple. However, Luther flinches at Alice's touch. And this is a really small moment and a really small movement, but it's really significant. It moves them away from the centre of the frame and also represents Alice as someone who has, on some level, frightened Luther. There are lots of interesting shots in this show as a whole and one of them I think is the shot that we get here which is filmed through the window because it makes again it makes us feel like we're getting some sort of exclusive content we're literally watching something that is happening behind closed doors but we're left with Luther leaving and the setting that we see as Luther leaves is fairly significant to what's going to happen later on um but again, I didn't want to repeat myself given that this presentation is like 72 slides long as it is. What we're left with though is Alice holding a hairpin. Now the movement of the hairpin is very seductive. So it sets her up as this sort of femme fatale character. The dramatic camera movement that we get behind Luther tracks him and again is very representative of the way that he moved when he was pursuing Madsen. So we have the connotations of Luther with Madsen that we saw right at the beginning linked with the recognisable setting which the audience should be aware is Zoe's office. Zoe, when we see her, is off-centre within the frame, which emphasises the row of legal books behind her, and this makes her seem more powerful even if she is surprised and even if she's sitting down here. And this is reinforced in that third shot where we are behind Zoe, almost as if we've got her back. 
and this makes her seem quite dominant. So we get juxtaposition here because the previous representation of Zoe is someone who very stereotypically, like a lot of women in crime dramas, sort of needs rescuing. The way they're sitting also makes Luther seem like he's being interrogated. So we've got further juxtaposition for his character because we wouldn't expect a police officer or detective to be interrogated. Now, the security guards behind the door, again, provide an element of comic relief, given how little power they have despite their status. And similar to an earlier shot with Ripley, Luther shows his warrant card and credentials. So it's clear that he relies on this prop to get him out of situations or to sort of justify his actions. And interestingly, we see Ripley in the very next shot where he sort of arrives to rescue Luther. And we have a level of sort of camaraderie between the two characters, showing that they're becoming closer, cementing a relationship that's going to be important for later episodes and later series. However, when we next see Alice, we've got a sort of to level of subterfuge with her character. She's clearly in disguise, which is another convention of crime dramas, and she's got the hairpin again. This makes the audience sort of feel like we're on edge because we know she doesn't have good intentions. That's clearly well established here. And this is further reinforced when we see Zoe moving on her own towards the camera because we know that she's isolated and it's putting her into a position of peril. The action that then comes is expected, but the shot that we have with it suggests a level of vulnerability. Alice has dragged Zoe into a sheltered and secluded area, which makes the audience, us, the only witness to what is happening here. And her attack seems very, very personal and vicious. So for the first time we get sort of visual proof that Alice is capable of the things that she's being accused of. And it's quite surprising that she actually lets Zoe go. So when we then cut to Luther alone in the office, we get this sense that this case is becoming quite overwhelming. And that might well be a feeling that the audience are getting as well. He's surrounded by paperwork on this case. But when he receives the phone call, we can see he becomes visually upset and we can imagine what he's being told on the other end of the phone, particularly when he upends his desk in the third shot and the action comes towards the audience. So we feel like we're in the scene and it makes the emotions more present because it's almost like this is happening to us. Now we view Luther asking for help through the office window of Teller and this makes it seem like Luther's a sort of character who doesn't really ask for help very often or who finds it hard to ask for help which reinforces his lone wolf representation. Looking down on the photos though, again, we get this sort of shocking visual representation of what's going on inside Luther's mind. Now in the centre of the frame, or sort of just off centre of the frame, is the photograph of the dog, which was a close-up shot earlier. Again, it's quite graphic, but it's really well designed because, again, even if we don't realise it right this moment, the dog is crucial for solving this case. And so we've got the sort of director setting up right from the beginning how important this dog is going to be through emphasising and focusing on this animal and this brutal attack. Now, when Reed gives Luther the gun in the third scene and in the third shot that we've got here, the positioning is important because the gun is pointing directly towards one of the victims in the photograph. And so we sort of get this visual representation of how Alice committed the crime. When we see Luther rummaging through the boxes, what he's actually rummaging through are evidence bags. So again, provides detail to his character as someone who only cares about proving the case and proving justice rather than following the rules. And it's as he's explaining the case to Teller that the audience start to realise what has happened because it's almost like he's explaining it to us. So this would provide a level of gratification to the audience who are watching, not only because we want to be entertained, but because we want to know what happened and why. But if anybody has been playing along with Luther and has tried to be this sort of pseudo detective, if they've got this right, then it provides them with another level of gratification. 
Now, aside from being really proud of myself for managing to pick this shot in the, th in the third frame here, um, Luther seems really reckless when he's setting the gun on fire within Teller's office. The audience are likely to feel like this is the climax of the narrative where Alex is fi Alice is finally brought to justice. But when it doesn't work, the tension is sort of in one way, it's removed from the scene because we're we're not building up to anything, but it sort of just goes back to the high level of, that it was at before. We feel let down on one hand, but we know that there's going to be a greater climax to come later on. So the tension still remains relatively high. The positioning of Ripley is also important because it shows that he's looking up to Luther. Now, this is representative of the fact that he's a junior compared to Luther, so he'll be looking up to him figuratively, but also that he's physically looking up to him here. Now, we get this establishing shot again, and we recognise the building now because this is where Luther has been meeting Alice before. So we know that he's going to be somewhere near her house. But what we don't expect is for Luther to be put into the position of a criminal when we see him in this extreme close up, picking the lock to break into Alice's building. Immediately, he moves towards the urn that we saw earlier. And this adds to this foreshadowing that we've had all the way through the show so far. Suspense, though, is increased as we expected it to be when the audience see Alice returning home. Now, this is a common narrative convention of action and crime drama genres because parts of the narrative are going to be time critical. And we have two situations playing out now at the same time where Luther is desperately trying to find the evidence that he needs, but we're urging him to go quicker, go quicker, go quicker because we know that Alice is getting home. The close-up on the parts of the gun Luther finds creates this subdued climax. It confirms to us that Luther was right. It confirms to us that what happened actually happened. But a bigger concern for us right now is, is he going to get out on time? Which raises this enigma. The floor numbers in the lift also provide a visual countdown which adds to the suspense for the audience. And I should just apologise right now for all of the spelling and typo errors that I've noticed throughout this video, but please understand how long this has taken me. This presentation is 72 slides long. So as we're getting the floor numbers counting down and adding to the suspense every time they count down, we get this sort of sense of relief when Alice walk pa walks past Luther. He moves to the side at just the moment the doors open, almost as if he knew that she was going to be there. So we feel like Luther's really lucky because he's gotten away with it. We think, great, now he's going to be able to bring Alice to justice. But we get this unexpected and unusual moment where Luther then gets Alice's attention and we wonder why he's done this why is he flaunting to her that he's got the the evidence here because we know that Alice doesn't react very well and the close up on the knife shows the very real danger that Luther is in we're left in suspense and with this enigma Alice's character has been proven to be psychopathic so it's logical that it isn't logical that Luther would taunt her in this way and in a similar chase to Madsen at the beginning Alice starts to chase after Luther, but now we see that he's the prey and through this over the shoulder shot we see that she's in pursuit of him and is the predator. And the camera cuts to the knife in her hand, reminding us that Luther is in very real danger here. Now, Alice becomes more dominant as in control physically, which is unusual again for a woman. And it's very unusual that a woman would be positioned as a villain because that's not really common for crime dramas as a whole. To a passerby, they would seem like they're a couple having a conversation, which again puts us in a very privileged position because we know what's going on. And even though Alice is in control physically, Luther seems to be in control mentally, which makes him throwing the urn off the bridge really confusing. We know that he'd got the evidence to prove what Alice did, but it's like he's literally thrown it all away. Now, when he overpowers Alice, and all of this happens really, really quickly, when he overpowers Alice, it shows that he's been in control for the entire time. Now, one reading of this scene could be that he's basically just bringing a criminal to justice and that he's using reasonable force. But an oppositional reading would suggest that the violence towards a woman is really out of character for him. 
And maybe a negotiated reading would be that this was something that was building up all along, given the way that he acted in Zoe's house. Alice, in fact, actually seems sort of fearful, which is not something that the audience have witnessed in her character. So we get to see a different side of her at this point. And what's interesting is that when they both step back, again, they're positioned to look really similar in terms of their body language. So we've got all of these connections between Alice and Luther adding up to something that's quite important here, suggest that they're very similar in character. However, the emphasis on Luther's wedding ring resolves this romantic subplot that had sort of been hinted at and suggested throughout the episode and it shuts it down completely. It also suggests that part of Luther's personality is this sense of loyalty and, and never giving up. Which again is revealed when he takes out these parts of the gun and we feel a sense of success. It shows that his intelligence and his intellect has prevailed because he got the forethought to keep them and can sort of control them before throwing the urn away, which goes against expectations when he literally throws them on the floor. And this is eventually how he beats Alice. So in a sense, we get a sort of subdued climax or we we get a sort of letdown climax because Luther has effectively solved this case by taking away all of the attention that Alice wanted. And by doing that, not only has he solved what happened, but he's put an end to her chasing him over it. Now we cut to a different scene where we see the reflection in the window of Ripley's car and it should give us some indication of where uh, Luther is at this point, particularly given the emphasis on his wedding ring, where we can understand that he has been to Zoe's house and that Ripley has been in effect guarding Zoe. Now Zoe and Mark are together and they seem really rattled and nervous. This raises suspense and enigma for the audience because we want to know how Luther will react to the fact that Mark is there. Now when the two men are together, they're positioned in a way that sort of implies a standoff between the two of them. There is again this other pause in action similar to the one that Luther and Zoe experienced earlier in the episode, which tells us that this is going to be kind of a fiery end to the episode. Now, given Luther's aggression last time he was here, it seems unusual that Mark is the one who then starts the fight. And this provides a level of conflict and also a social talking point as to whether Luther deserved this response that he's getting here. Again, common convention and prop. I suppose you could argue that it's a prop of the police cars are appropriate for the genre. But the fact that either side of Luther suggests that the law has closed in on him and that he cannot escape. And the police manhandling him in that centre frame provides a sense of juxtaposition because they're sort of fighting against one of their own, whichever way you read into this. What isn't expected, though, is that Zoe sort of shows more nerve when she faces Luther. And this kind of brings a resolution to their character arc, whilst also providing some sort of relatability for the audience. Now, Luther in the back of the police car mirrors the way that Alice was when she was being taken back to her apartment. Now, despite the resolution in her case, we still get this idea that the two characters are linked together for further episodes. And this scene on the left is linked to the middle shot where we see Alice walking down the hospital corridor. The long shot centres her in the frame, showing her importance, and the audience can also guess where she's going to be so we get a little bit of foreshadowing here now as she glances through the window we're given for further foreshadowing because we may have worked out where she is and what she's planning to do and even if we haven't the very next scene shows us madsen through the window now we're placed into the position of alice here who was looking at him just a moment ago but ultimately this provides a cliffhanger for further episodes because his fate remains uncertain and the black screen which ends the episode ends it sort of forcefully, but provides a teaser for the next episode through the white sans serif text, providing um, sort of clips or teasers of what's going to come next is a common structural element of the series. And because you guys are only looking at season one, episode one, I didn't analyse the what comes next section, but I'm sure you guys can do that yourself using my slides here as an example. Whew. And we're done. <laughs> so there were so, <laughs> there were so many key terms here that I couldn't fit them into my little bubble at the end. There are so many that 
it would be impossible for you guys, well not impossible, but it would be a really mammoth task to make note cards out of all of these. The best thing that you can do is to have a look through all of these key terms, pick out the ones that you don't already know and find the definitions for them so that you know exactly what you're looking for. Thank you so much for your patience and forbearance as I've been making this video. It has been one mammoth task. Um, over the next few videos I'll be breaking down Luther into different sections that you might get asked in your exam. I know that you guys are studying the Sweeney as well, so that's going to be another episode that I'm going to have to de deconstruct and make it into some sort of mammoth uh, video. And as you can tell, I'm already at the end of my processing ability to sort of think and speak. So that's going to be another week or two before I get that video up. I won't be around next weekend, but if I can, I will try and get another video up for you guys in the meantime. If you haven't already, please subscribe, hit the button down below, hit the little bell icon next to it to be given instant notifications every time I upload a new video. You can pop your comments in the comment section down below. I do read every single comment and it is really, I don't know, just I appreciate all of your comments so much because this does take me a lot of time and there are moments where I think, oh, is it worth it? But knowing that you guys find them useful is amazing. You can also get in touch with me through Twitter at media underscore revision. And I will see you guys at some point in the next couple of weeks with another video.